Hello everyone and welcome to a presentation on recently approved endoscopic bariatric therapies, the Aspire Assist system and the Obalon balloon system. This webinar is sponsored in part by the Association for Bariatric Endoscopy or ABE and by an educational grant from Obalon Therapeutics. I'm Marty Roth and I will be your moderator for tonight's program. Your presenters for this evening are Drs. Shelby Sullivan, Nitin Kumar, and Vivek Kumbari, all who serve on the advisory board for ABE. Dr. Sullivan is Director of Gastroenterology, Metabolic and Bariatric Program and Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Dr. Kumar is in Gastroenterology and Bariatric Endoscopy at the HSHS Medical Group in Effingham, Illinois. Dr. Kumbari is Assistant Professor of Medicine, Director of Endoscopy at Bayview Medical Center, and Director of Bariatric Endoscopy at John Hopkins Medicine. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. There will be a question and answer session at the close of the presentation. Questions can be submitted at any time online by using the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. If you do not see the question box, please click the white arrow in the orange box located on the right side of your screen. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the ABE website for future use. The presentation slides will be emailed to you after this call and available on the ABE website within 48 hours. At this time, I would like to turn the webinar over to Dr. Kumari. Thank you for the introduction. This is Nitin Kumar, and I'm going to discuss an overview of obesity management and the importance of a multidisciplinary program. So the philosophy of this is a little bit different than our gastroenterology or surgery practices. We will attempt to provide comprehensive care to patients with obesity, which will involve a team approach uh, to deliver intensive lifestyle therapy and post-procedure care. And this is a different paradigm than most endoscopic procedures. So traditionally, you might get a referral from a primary care physician, perform a procedure, and then refer them back, and you may or may not see them again in the future. In an endoscopic bariatric therapy model, regardless of what device you're using, you can get a referral from a primary care physician or the patient may come to you on their own. You'll evaluate the patient with your team and perform a procedure and then follow the patient independently from their primary physician. Your assessment, whatever therapy you use, should involve a weight history, a dietary history, life events that led to weight gain, therapies attempted for weight loss and reasons for success or failure, obesity-related comorbidities, screen them for eating disorders, and screen for barriers to exercise and address those if needed. It's also important to educate patients about their options, the risks and the benefits, alternatives including the risks and benefits and general efficacy of medications, other endoscopic bariatric therapies, and surgical alternatives, and the weight loss expectations, both how much weight they might lose and for how long they could expect with an endoscopic bariatric therapy. Patient selection is important. Uh, the BMI range, whether they've failed diet and lifestyle therapy, whether they're motivated and willing to adhere to a program or just looking for a quick fix. And it's important to refer patients for medical weight loss or to bariatric surgeons as indicated if they haven't tried medical weight loss before or if they're more appropriate for bariatric surgery. Psychological assessment is also important, maybe unlike other endoscopic procedures. Trials of endoscopic bariatric therapy that have been performed for various devices generally screen for eating disorders, psychiatric illness, and substance abuse. And eventually you can train <clears throat> your staff to perform questionnaires and to interview patients about these issues. And then if positive uh, for, for screening for these, they can be referred to a psychologist or a psychiatrist if needed. Additionally, it's important to screen for other behavioral challenges, and these include inability or unwillingness to follow a program, frequent missed appointments, 
and these need to be addressed with a discussion and maybe a patient contract. It's important to set expectations for whatever therapy you use. It's important to avoid surprises. Make sure they know approximate weight loss outcomes in terms of both weight and waist size, post-procedure symptoms that they might experience, uh, that they will need to put effort into diet and lifestyle modification, that rigorous follow-up will be needed, and if you can, to provide them with some expectation of costs, including for anti-emetics, IV fluids, if the procedure is contraindicated and has to be aborted, or for early removal of a device. Your team can help you with this, and we have published a position statement on this. We do recommend concurrent lifestyle therapy in all patients, whatever therapy you use. And we recommend long-term enrollment after the procedure. And it's a good idea to familiarize yourself with the AHA, ACC, TOS guideline for the management of overweight and obesity in adults. The team can include a dietitian, a psychologist, a behavior coach, physical therapist, exercise physiologist. And these are essential to have access to, but they don't necessarily have to be employed by you or even located in your office. The registered dietitian can help you with medical nutrition therapy and behavioral therapy for weight loss. They can also be a point of contact and support for patients for dietary issues. Exercise therapy maintains muscle mass during weight loss and improves fitness and is essential for long-term weight maintenance. Uh, the guidelines recommend two to 300 minutes per week to maintain lost weight or prevent weight regain after therapy. So this can be managed by a physician and a electronic Tracking is often helpful with doing that, uh, and if it's ineffective or the patient reports challenges, then the patient can be referred to a specialist like a physical therapist or a personal trainer. Behavior modification can be delivered by a variety of professionals who can address challenges like snacking, skipping meals, avoiding activity, low sleep quality, and they might assist with disordered eating behavior like binge eating that sometimes it can escape your screening and, and may become apparent after the therapy. And we know that use of these professionals is associated with better weight loss results. So the care model, we know uh, intensity of therapy correlates with success and should continue for at least one year, but the frequency should match that of the trial used in FDA approval for the device. And if it's discontinued, the patient should be enrolled in another weight loss uh, program of their choice that will continue over the long term. Whether this is face-to-face -face in individual or group sessions or telephone or electronic, uh, something should be in place. Now, electronic options offer more convenience flexibility, potentially higher follow-up rates, and may handle tracking and calculations for you and can be a good complement to face-to-face -face individual group sessions. So an example of management is before the procedure, the patient can see the bariatric endoscopist, the dietary professional, and a fitness professional have the procedure and then maintain uh, initially frequent contact with the endoscopist and the dietitian, and then over time uh, less frequent contact with the endoscopist and, uh, and then regular contact with the dietitian and fitness professional throughout their post-procedure care. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kumbari to discuss these fire assists. Thanks very much, uh, Annette. And so, I'd just first, like to thank the team at the ABE for help uh, for helping with this presentation, and and uh, Nelson Nitten and Shelby for uh, some of the content. So, the Aspire Assist, um, so the uh, one of the more newer endoscopic weight loss therapies. So, I'll just take you through initially the the actual components of the uh, Aspire Assist system. So, you have your skin port, uh, which is uh, attaches to the aspiration tube or A-tube. And during the aspiration process, uh, the image on the right, you can see a, a reservoir bag which you fill with water to help flush, uh, to assist with aspiration. You have a, a companion and, and a connector to, to the skin. Uh, the patient line which sort of takes uh, fluid into the stomach and removes the, the contents from the stomach and the drainage tube which allows the, uh, the gastric contents to, to leave into the, um, the, the toilet. So the, the connector is a very important part of this device and, and in fact uh, is, functions as a safety mechanism. So the connector itself locks after 115 uses and this serves 
uh, sort of uh, a twofold. Uh, number one, if someone is over aspirating uh, and, and uh, the device, uh, which is incredibly rare, but if they are, then obviously the connector will lock uh, sooner than one would expect and, and that can alert the, the physician or the treating team. Uh, but also on the flip side, if you're not aspirating very often, uh, you'll find that your patient doesn't come back to you uh, for a new connector and that will also help guide you uh, in terms of ongoing management and maybe some encouragement to improve compliance or, or to try and work through some of the barriers. Uh, all these systems are carried around by the patient uh, and are required to for the aspiration process and they fit in a nice little carry bag which uh, you know can fit in a handbag or the palm of your hand. Uh, sorry, so this is, a, this is what the aspiration tube A-tube looks endoscopically. Uh, so you usually try and place it in the, the mid body of the stomach uh, on the anterior inferior wall uh, and the tube will end up uh, sort of riding up into the fundus of the stomach, which is uh, the area that you want to aspirate. So I thought it's, it's, it's important to talk about the mechanisms of action of this device. It is, it is more than simply aspiration of calories, and, and patients are often quite enlightened when you mention this to them. Uh, so importantly, there's decreased consumption of food, and, and this is for several reasons. Uh, one, to, for the particles to become less than five millimeters in size to allow them to fit through the aspiration tube, one has to chew. Uh, and chewing has, has lots of sort of additive benefits in terms of prolonging meal uh, and effectively uh, encouraging you to eat less. But also to help with the aspiration process, you have to increase the amount of water you consume. Uh, there is a thought that the actual gastrocutaneous fistula or the, ab the stomach being tacked onto the uh, abdominal wall uh, may alter gastric compliance and, and might sort of end up reducing uh, food consumption through a variety of proposed mechanisms. Uh, and also the, the actual aspiration system encourages you to avoid snacking or grazing throughout the day. I mean really the, the thought is that if you, uh, that if you eat, you, you should aspirate and therefore uh, you know, you're not going to want to aspirate uh, after a small snack. Uh, the, 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 the gains may not be worth the, uh, the efforts aspirating. So and it's, quite, it's a quite nice mechanism for those patients who, who do graze a lot. Uh, it also helps improve food choices. and. and you know, patients will often say that a sort of a low calorie or healthy foods uh, sort of have a more appealing appearance and, and potentially even smell on the aspiration process uh, compared to those sort of high fat meals. And you know, also the, there is aspiration of calories with uh, some data to show that approximately 30% of ingested calories are successfully aspirated. So I, I wanted to briefly run through some efficacy and safety data and uh, Shelby wrote this uh, very nice synopsis. Uh, regarding aspiration therapy for obesity in, in gastrointestinal endoscopy clinics in North America this year and certainly would encourage you to, to read that. Uh, so, so what are the publications to date? So there's been four studies published uh, looking at the effects of aspiration therapy on weight loss in patients with a BMI of, of 35 to 55, which is the, uh, the FDA approved range. Uh, so there's a pilot study in Mexico uh, which, uh, which went to 26 weeks. Uh, there's a US pilot study which was published in Gastroenterology in 2013. Uh, there's a Swedish pilot study uh, published soon after that, which, uh, which there's now also some two-year follow-up data. Uh, there, and then there's a, the pivotal uh, aspiration therapy and adjusted lifestyle therapy study or pathway study, which uh, I'll be referring to a fair bit uh, because it is the, uh, the US randomized controlled trial or uh, uh, FDA uh, sort of study for FDA approval, uh, which is also published in the American Journal. Uh, and more recently, there's some abstracts looking at uh, aspiration therapy in the, the super obese, i.e. BMI is of above 55, and also I'll present some data uh, on a European registry showing some long-term outcomes. Uh, so what's the percent total body weight uh, with aspiration therapy? And uh, it, 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 it certainly demonstrates that it is an effective therapy, and this is data looking at completer, a patients have completed uh, studies uh, or, and pivotal trials. And you can see, looking at the, the top two lines, uh, patients who were in sort of control groups of studies, they had a total body weight loss of around 5%. And if you compare this to, to those who, who had been aspirating up to a year, uh, you can see that the total body weight loss with aspiration therapy varies anywhere between sort of 14% to, to 21%. So uh, certainly, uh, um, you know, one of the more effective uh, endoscopic bariatric therapies. 
and, and so, so what happens after one year? Uh, this is some data uh, looking at more longer term outcomes of aspiration therapy and, and on this graphic, uh, this is a graph of, of all those who have continued to aspirate over time. Uh, so if you look at the results of the pathway study, that US randomized controlled trial where patients uh, were followed for one year, uh, they, had, um, they had a 14% total body weight loss. Now, if you look at the results from the European registry, they went to 20% to total body weight loss. And I think what's particularly interesting about this slide is that you, you can see that uh, uh, sort of weight loss sort of seems to proceed uh, to at least a year, and then it plateaus. Uh, and, you know, even with bariatric surgery, uh, there are patients who start to gain weight after one or two years, but it seems with the ongoing aspiration, uh, you, uh, you generally plateau. Um, this so, so I think it, it does speak to its durability uh, if, if uh, it's used continually. There certainly have been people who've used aspiration therapy for in excess of seven years in Europe. And this is some, some nice images basically demonstrating uh, that it can take you from being morbidly obese to, uh, to within the normal BMI category. Uh, and even those patients who lose a considerable amount of weight and, and would be deemed as having a BMI within normal range, they often uh, do keep the aspiration uh, apparatus in place and, and, and continue to use it. Uh, you know, we do, do know that obesity is a chronic disease and therefore uh, it's not uh, surprising that uh, ongoing aspiration can be helpful. Uh, so, so what about, so it, it obviously helps improve weight loss, but what about improvement in comorbidities? And this is uh, seems to be, um, you know, a somewhat criticism of, of, of several endoscopic therapies that the that the improvement in comorbidities is in proportion to what is seen with weight loss, as compared to bariatric surgery, for example, where uh, your comorbidities improve uh, greater than one would expect from than, uh, than just from weight loss alone. Uh, but we, we do know that with aspiration therapy, that there there is a reduced utilization. Of, uh, of, of medications such as antihypertensive medications, lipid lowering medications, and, and even anti-diabetic medications. And certainly this is a, an area for future research. And often one of, the, one of the concerns with aspiration therapy is that it can promote eating disorders. Uh, you know, people have, have talked about sort of purging disorders, bulimia, etc. Uh, and certainly, in, in summary, th this doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, so, so patients should always be screened, uh, and, and in all these studies presented, they're screened and excluded at baseline. And in, and in the, the U.S. study, the pathway study, and the U.S. pilot study, uh, patients were screened and surveyed uh, for the duration of the study uh, using several questionnaires, and, and, they were, and no eating disorders were identified. Uh, when you look at the results from the, the pathway study, it's interesting that, in fact, one, one subject from the control group was diagnosed with a binge eating disorder uh, at 28 weeks, uh, but no one in the treatment group. You know, there's, there's some other evidence to suggest there's no uh, sort of abuse uh, of uh, uh, whilst using the aspiration system. When, when, when you looked at the, the mean number of aspirations performed in the, in the first three to four months uh, of using the device, it was about two and a half times a day and, and uh, an average of two times a day thereafter. Uh, and there was there was no one who was aspirating greater than three times a day uh, on average. So, so I think it's fair to say that with 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 good screening, uh, the appropriate usage of questionnaires, that you uh, that you wouldn't expect to run into problems with uh, with facilitating any eating disorders. And in fact, on, on the contrary, aspiration therapy seems to improve eating behaviours. Uh, so so we know that patients who are in the aspiration therapy group in fact showed improvement in all three measures of the three-factor eating questionnaire. So this is improved restraint, less disinhibition, uh, and decreased hunger. Uh, and also what's particularly interesting, and I think it tells you a lot about uh, the, the psychology behind eating uh, and, and how that none of us really eat uh, for the purpose of sustaining existence. We all eat for sort of uh, lots of social and other reasons. Uh, but despite patients aspirating about a third of calories after a meal, uh, there were no significant changes in visual analog scales uh, in the aspiration therapy group subjects for, for hunger, for increased thoughts of food, for increased cravings, uh, and decreased feelings of fullness. So, you know, one, one would think that if you're aspirating a third of calories, your next meal you're going to eat a third more, uh, but certainly uh, that is not the case.
And, and what about adverse events? And the adverse events seen are, are really in keeping with one, what one might expect with any uh, PEG tubes. Uh, so in the pathway study, the, 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 the largest study, uh, there was an N of five patients who had some serious adverse events, and, and by serious meaning one patient had two, uh, two separate overnight admissions in hospitals, and each, of, each one was deemed a serious adverse event. There's a patient with mild uh, perioperative peritonitis, uh, which uh, healed with intravenous antibiotics. Uh, another patient has a mild ulceration, uh, which was treated by the aspiration tube removal, and uh, fungal colonization was seen as well. Uh, th there is a reasonable rate of uh, non-serious adverse events, you know, anywhere but up to 40%, uh, and this is pain after the A-tube placement. The, the aspiration tube is, uh, is 26 French, so it is larger than most uh, standard pig feeding tubes. Uh, there may be a little bit of movement uh, with the aspiration tube, uh, and so granulation tissue can form, and that can cause some, some discomfort. And also, there is a, a small cohort of patients that seem to get some intermittent abdominal uh, pain as well. And I think this, this uh, slide goes to uh, the fact that when patients uh, are aspirating, uh, they, they often are enjoying what they're doing. And certainly, the, the US Pivotal study, which went out to two years, showed that around 70% of patients uh, who, so when, when all patients were offered uh, to continue aspirating after one year, 70% agreed to aspirate for, for, for a longer period of time, up to two years. So uh, I think uh, once used, uh, the majority of patients are quite happy to use it in view of its uh, sort of uh, minimal invasiveness, safety, as, as well as its efficacy. Uh, so, so this here really demonstrates that most patients uh, are either very satisfied or at least somewhat satisfied. The great majority, uh, you know, over 90% of patients are at least that uh, when uh, using the device, and most of them are certainly willing to recommend this to others. And, and you see this on the on the sort of Facebook pro, Facebook. Uh, sort of aspire Facebook post. There is a lot of uh, uh, chat about this and, and certainly people encourage each other. Uh, so, so what about optimizing patient and facility selection? Uh, you know, I often get asked which patients are, are most suitable for this therapy, particularly because there is an overlap uh, in, the, in the BMIs between aspiration therapy and bariatric surgery. Uh, so the FDA indications for use are uh, age greater than 22. Uh, as, as, per, as per the literature, uh, it's been uh, uh, it's recommended for use in BMIs between 35 and 55, but certainly has been used in BMIs above 55 overseas. Uh, it, you know, they recommend patients uh, should have failed to lose weight or maintain weight loss with non-surgical weight loss therapies, and, and one must be compliant, of course, with uh, lifestyle intervention, uh, as well as ongoing medical supervision, which is uh, you know, mandatory with this particular therapy. So, so in my opinion, I think it's a great option for, for patients who've got a BMI uh, above 40 where you know, endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty and intragastric balloons may not be uh, as helpful. Um, you know, we know that the intragastric balloons can cause GERD uh, and aspiration therapy would, would logically reduce uh, GERD symptoms. Uh, hiatal hernia is not too much of a problem here. Patients requiring chronic anticoagulation uh, shouldn't uh, have the intragastric balloons and they're quite suitable for this. Uh, those are gastroparetics. You know, a lot of people are also concerned about the nausea and vomiting that may occur with intragastric balloons, and I think this is a, a nice alternative for them. Uh, and I think it's, you know, also patients will, will say that, that they want more control over their eating. Uh, and so if they do celebrate an anniversary and they want to enjoy a meal with their family, uh, you know, they are allowed to, uh, to, to have that on occasion uh, without having significant restrictive effects. Uh, what about contraindications? Uh, you know, as one might expect, eating disorders uh, is, a, is a contraindication to this. If your lifestyle is not conducive to aspirating, I mean, for this to be effective, you really need to uh, to be compliant aspirating, otherwise it simply will not work. Uh, obviously, if you've got an abdominal wall mesh, you shouldn't place a peg. Um, and if you post bariatric surgery or, or other surgeries complicating peg, peg placement, so you, you don't want to, because of the length of the aspiration tube, uh, you need to have a stomach that's essentially normal in size. I think it is important uh, to, to assess their eating behaviors, and there are several questionnaires that are available and should be used for screening patients prior to uh, insertion of the device, um, and, and sort of a, I've listed three here uh, that are commonly used. And if you're really not comfortable with these questionnaires, you, you can refer on to a psychologist uh, who has expertise in this area. Uh, so, so one of the... Uh, one of the, one of the 
the, fa the, the facets that make endoscopic bariatric therapies um, uh, sort of um, uh, of interest to people is the fact that it is generally an outpatient and, and generally co uh, sort of more uh, cost conscious than surgical therapies. And this is particularly so when done in, uh, in outpatient surgery centers. Uh, but what you might find is, um, you know, outpatient surgery centers are quite happy to do intragastric balloons because they, they can see patients with BMIs above 40. But, you know, I have run into some trouble with uh, surgical centers, outpatient centers not being interested in doing patients who've got BMIs above 45 or 55. And in fact, they're not accredited to do so often. Uh, and so if you do bring this, bring this procedure to a hospital, it can be far more costly because of the facility fee, the high anesthesia fees, and often devices are, uh, get a significant markup. Uh, at, at our hospital, they are 100% markup uh, for, um, uh, for, for, for the aspiration system. Uh, so this can, this can price it significantly higher than what one would expect from an outpatient surgery center. Now, one of the things that you, you need to be aware of, if you, if you are doing this at an ASC type facility, just uh, remember that these patients are heavy and so uh, having a bariatric stretcher and may well be helpful. I just wanted to mention some procedural tips. And initially, I was a little concerned about how would I place a peg in someone with a BMI, you know, above 50. Uh, will I be able to transilluminate? How safe is it, etc. Uh, and certainly, there is a literature to show not only Aspire literature, but even standard peg literature to show that uh, it is uh, safe uh, in patients who are obese. Uh, so I, you know, often you can't see the ribs on these patients; uh, they're a little bit too large. So I sort of mark the, the lower rib, ribs on both sides with a marker. Uh, I, I can tilt the patient a little bit to the left whilst in the supine position. I think this helps find uh, a nice spot to place the tube. Now, sometimes if patients have a really thick abdominal wall, a spinal needle is necessary. Uh, uh, in addition to the standard trocar that comes with the, the pull peg kit, uh, the, the gastrostomy creation uh, can be a little challenging and you almost feel like you, you need a leap of faith uh, on a rare occasion. Uh, again, transillumination doesn't always happen. Uh, and, and so sometimes you rely on one-to-one -one indentation as well as sort of putting negative pressure on a syringe as you're inserting it through the abdominal wall uh, towards the stomach. And, and the idea being if you hit uh, a bit of a small or large bowel that you'll suddenly aspirate some gas in, and you know that probably isn't the best site to proceed. Uh, and, and as mentioned, you're placing the tube in sort of the mid-gastric body on the anterior wall uh, works nicely. Uh, so, so when you place the tube as, as a standard peg, we, we'd give them, uh, you know, a third generation uh, kefosporin um, and also some oral antibiotics for 24 hours afterwards. Uh, we do all our patients with monitored anesthetic care. We, we, we don't intubate these. Uh, and some patients have some pain and nausea post-procedure. Um, you know, rarely is it significant enough to, to require a narcotic, or sometimes just having the patient uh, have that script accessible uh, puts them at ease. So, uh, you know, Norco or Hyset is a uh, acetaminophen, uh, oxycodone combination, uh, tramadol, uh, and some Zofran can be helpful as well. Uh, so in terms of post-placement, you don't actually start aspirating immediately after you place the tube. Uh, there has to be a tube adjustment that occurs about 10 to 14 days, and, and I'll talk a bit more, more about that in a second. But, uh, you know, as soon as the tube goes in, uh, you just have to uh, do what you normally do with a pig tube, you know, shower for 48 hours, and and sort of clean with soap and water and, and tap it dry. Uh, you don't want this tube to be too tight uh, because uh, in the, when the patient's in the supine position, because as you know, when, when you have uh, some, some abdominal girth and you sit forward, uh, often the, uh, the peg tubes can become too tight if they're already flush against the, the skin surface in the supine position. And there are a small proportion of patients that have pain sort of two to three days after peg tube. It's pretty rare. But if it is, rather than continuing them on opiates, you might try a, uh, another, another medication. Uh, so I'll just play this video while, uh, while talking about the conversion of the A tube and the skin port. So, so this happens at about 10 to 14 days. Uh, you do this in the supine position. You can see on the video there's a connector that you, uh, that you can sort of size with the patient sort of initially sitting up and then lying flat. Uh, you want a little bit of space between the uh, connector and the actual skin surface. Uh, once you connect and basically clamp the tube, you uh, you cut it, and then you uh, you add the uh, you add the connection apparatus. Uh, it, it takes a couple of minutes, uh, and, but but uh, it does. Uh, it, it sort of the steps are very easy to follow, and I actually always do an aspiration in the office 
on, on the, so the first aspiration is done with me present. So it all seems a little bit odd, but, but you, your nurse, and the patient, and, and maybe their family member, all sort of head off to the bathroom. Uh, you'll stand around there together, and you, uh, you watch the patient aspirate after they've had a, a soft diet. Uh, you know, it takes a couple of minutes, but I think it is a, a very important part uh, to make sure that the patient is in fact doing this properly because uh, uh, sort of effective aspiration is the key to, uh, to success. And so, uh, I mean, I won't play the full video, but that's basically the, the, the half of the connector added on and, and then the second disc will be uh, placed on it. So what about granulation tissue? Um, you know, the, these tubes uh, can move a little bit with the uh, sort of increased thickness of the abdominal wall. Uh, so you can get a bit of um, uh, granulation tissue there. Uh, and this is probably related to, to the tube movement. And so, a, uh, so appropriately stabilizing the, the A tube uh, is possible. And there are sort of clamps for that. Uh, keeping the site clean and dry. Uh, stopping the proton pump inhibitor uh, can be helpful as well. Uh, there's a, 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 a topical ointment called granulotion, uh, which is very effective. Uh, it, where that doesn't work, you might try some topical silver nitrate. Uh, it certainly works, and, and there have been reports. I, I've never done this uh, as yet, never had to, but there are reports of using ablation with, with argon plasma, uh, as well as resection uh, for those with uh, sort of really significant problems with, with granulation tissue. Uh, so after their first aspiration you offset, the sort of patient then goes away and, and you instruct them to have a puree diet for at least a week. And, and what you want to do is you want to make the aspiration process for them as, as easy as possible. So having a, a puree diet, they're, they're often finding that a lot of what they're consuming orally in fact is successfully aspirated. So it teaches them uh, you know, what it should look like. They don't have trouble with, with clogging of the tube, etc. So it's, it's a nice slow introduction. And then you sort of gradually work up food consistency with a soft diet and then a a standard healthy diet. Uh, and uh, you know, just um, just wanted to sort of verbally answer a, a couple of questions that I often get uh, in the clinic. Uh, how long can the system be used for? Uh, many years. Um, uh, it is certainly a, a, a good long-term therapy for uh, patients with obesity, uh, which is certainly known to be a chronic disease. Uh, do, do uh, the other question I get is, you know, do we ever see a persistent gastrocutaneous fistula after removal? Uh, this, this is more apparent in in uh, where the A tube has been uh, kept inside you for for over 12 to 18 months. Uh, if it is, then you know, due to the size of the tube, uh, the uh, sometimes there is endoscopic assistance required for closure, and, and this is uh, you know very effective. Uh, so uh, sort of the devitalizing the tissue and, and suturing it closed uh, can be helpful. You can even sort of use you know, percutaneous full thickness sutures, uh, or you can use, uh, you know, the endoscopic suturing system. And the other question I get is, you know, can bariatric surgery be performed after uh, the aspiration tube is removed? And, and certainly there, there are reports of this, uh, and uh, the surgeons, uh, you know, ha haven't said that this makes their, their procedure uh, particularly more difficult. Uh, so I'll sort of stop there and hand over to, uh, to Shelby to talk about the Oberlock balloon system. Thanks, Vivek. Um, so we are going on to the Ovalon balloon system. Um, let me see if I can take control over here. Here we go. These are my disclosures. Um, I do have um, uh, research support, and I also um, have been a consultant for Oblon as well as a number of other device um, companies, um, including mostly for working on lifestyle therapy protocols for the trials that we've worked on. The other thing I want to disclose is that many of these tips are not evidence-based, but are really based on um, practice experience. Um, so the Oblon balloon system is a balloon that is contained in a capsule and that capsule is swallowed. It's connected to a catheter, or tethered to a catheter, um, that is then used to fill the balloon with a gas. And you do this with the easy fill inflation system, and you can see on the left-hand side here, or the right-hand side here, the, um, what a, a gas-filled balloon looks like. Each one of these balloons is 250 milliliters, and when they are, uh, three of them are placed over time, so you have a total of 750 milliliters of volume that's taken up in the stomach. The six-month adjunct adjunctive weight reduction therapy trial, or SMART, 
um, trial design was a randomized sham controlled trial with one-to-one -one randomization with balloons plus weight loss or sham plus weight loss. So all of the patients actually swallowed a capsule and they didn't know whether or not it had a balloon in it or whether it had a ribbon of sugar. They looked really similar, had the same weight, um, and we did the same inflation process for all patients. After six months, we unblinded. The people who were in the um, active arm continued for observational weight loss, and the people who were in the control arm crossed over and got balloons. Um, the devices were swallowed on day zero, week three, and either weeks nine or 12, depending on whether or not they had had weight loss at the week nine visit. They also received preventative treatment with antispasmodics and anti-emetic medications at each um, swallow visit. And they were also given a proton pump inhibitor starting one week before day zero. They all got moderate intensity lifestyle therapy, which um, took about 25 minutes and occurred every three weeks. The trial summary, 419 subjects were randomized um, with two swallow attempts. 387 subjects um, were treated, which means that they had at least received one device. So there were definitely patients who made a swallow attempt but were not able to get even one balloon down um, on two separate swallow attempts. Um, 366 subjects were included in the per protocol analysis population and those were people who swallowed at least two devices and had those, those balloons in for at least 18 weeks. Our co-primary endpoints were mean percent total body weight loss in treatment versus control and a treatment responder rate of greater than 5% in 35, in greater than 35% of subjects. And of course, there was the observational safety endpoint, um, which was all device-related adverse events, both serious and non-serious. Um, so I just want to show you here the weight loss graph. So in this trial, we had um, the three balloons were swallowed at the points where you see the arrows. And you can see that there is a difference between the active arm and the control arm of about two times as much weight loss and there was a significant um, effect of the third balloon. And this is, all, I, I actually show this slide to um, my patients as well, or at least this graph to my patients. And one of the reasons why I do that is so that I can really encourage them to get the third balloon. I, almost everybody does get the third balloon, but it's really important because it actually does enhance the amount of weight loss that patients get. Um, and that enhancement or increase in the rate of weight loss occurs in the trial, at least at that um, three-month time point or 12-week time point when they got the third balloon. Um, this is different than the fluid-filled balloons where 80% of the weight loss typically occurs within the first, first three to four months of balloon placement, so it's a little bit different. Um, the responder rate was also with um, greater than 5% total body weight loss was 69, or I'm sorry, 65%. The other thing that's important to note is that weight loss maintenance was actually quite good. So in any patient that lost at least 0.1 um, pounds. So anybody who lost any amount of weight was included in this weight loss maintenance analysis. And these patients had an average weight loss of 7.6% at the end of the, the, um, the uh, portion with the balloon in place. And at the 12-month time point had maintained roughly 90% of that weight loss that they had achieved in the initial um, part of the trial. They also had improvements in glucose and triglycerides. Um, there was also a low number of adverse events. So in both, when you included both the initial active subjects and the subjects that were in the control arm that crossed over, there was only one serious adverse event for a, for a serious adverse event rate of 0.3%. There was one patient who developed a bleeding ulcer and who was on high dose NSAIDs, which was prohibited by the protocol. Um, and that occurred after a patient got a knee replacement. The balloons were removed. Um, they, got, they did get a blood transfusion, but no other therapy was required and um, the, the um, ulcer resolved without sequela. There were um, non-serious adverse events, the majority of which were either mild or moderate. And mild or moderate means that they were either treated with nothing or they were treated with um, a medication. Um, there were only five or 0.4 um, reports of severe non-serious adverse events. So the... Um, the non-serious adverse events you can see here, there is some abdominal pain, nausea, heartburn and digestion, um, vomiting, uh, bloating, belching, uh, burping, diarrhea. But I think the important thing to note is that um, for the most part, almost all of these events were mild event events, meaning that they didn't require any therapy um, for resolution. Um, there was also procedure-related um, uh, events that occurred at removal. Um, or events that were noted at removal. So there was um, gastric irritation or inflammation or polyps. And again, um, 
polyps in the stomach can occur because of um, being on proton pump inhibitor, in inhibitor therapy as well. Um, and that these all occurred in a fairly low number of patients. In terms of procedure-related events, these were also mild events. There were only um, four moderate events that were actually noted um, on removal. So in general, very safe removal um, and uh, very low rates of balloon-related um, issues. So who is not a candidate for the balloon system? So if patients have problems with swallowing, they are not a candidate for the Obalon balloon system. If somebody looks at the capsule and says, this is definitely not something that I can do, they are not a candidate for this procedure. If they take prescription aspirin, anti-inflammatory drugs, anticoagulants, not, they're not candidates. If they've had weight loss surgery um, or the lap band, like all balloons, this is not, uh, that does increase the risk of perforation, so this is uh, contraindicated. If the patients are unwilling to take prescribed proton pump inhibitor, they really shouldn't have these procedures. And of course, um, if they have any other really significant medical history, that would prevent them from getting um, a procedure. One thing that I will also mention is that, um, especially in the setting of, since we're gastroenterologists and treating lots of patients, um, the, one of the contraindications um, for this and all of the balloons is um, uh, cirrhosis with liver failure, just something to think about um, for those of us who are, are seeing a lot of these patients. So for the pre-procedure evaluation, there are some additional things to do for this device and some of the other devices. One is you always want to revert, review GERD symptoms or dysphagia. And I do this for actually all of my balloon patients. There's also an Obalon placebo capsule test. So this capsule is the same size and shape as the balloon capsule, and it's filled with sugar, which will dissolve. So both the capsule will dissolve and the sugar inside it, of course, will dissolve. And so in the, my initial office evaluation, I will actually go through the process of having the patient swallow this capsule. If they can't swallow it, then they are not a candidate for therapy. If they feel like it gets stuck somewhere, they are likely not a candidate for therapy. Patients also have to go, undergo a barium esophagram. We don't do endoscopies for these patients um, because this is a, a device that's swallowed. But we do want to rule out a hiatal hernia greater than two centimeters, esophageal stricture, or severe esophagitis, which can all be seen on a barium esophagram. <clears throat> we also right now use fluoroscopy to administer these balloons or to do verification that the balloons are actually in place. And this is what one of those images looks like with three balloons actually in place. The balloons itself are shaped as an ellipse. So you are seeing some of the balloons that are um, on FOSS and some that are kind of on their side. Uh, and so that's why there's kind of a, a different shape look um, for, these, for these balloons in this image. If a balloon deflates, it is completely flat. So that is um, one of the things to note if you think that there might have been a deflation. And that flattening of the balloon occurs because of um, gastric um, contractions on the balloons. And that will occur within about 25 to 30 minutes of any kind of leakage of um, gas coming out of the balloon. So in terms of pre-administration prep, you do have to get the device or the easy fill dispenser prepped um, in order to inflate the balloon. I usually do this myself because I always want to make sure that my easy fill dispenser has been um, appropriately, uh, uh, um, appropriately prepped. The other thing is that I want to make sure that I'm prepping this about five minutes before, within five minutes before I bring the patient back to the room. So it's really within a short period of time um, that I'm getting everything ready before the patient comes in to do their swallow. Um, a couple of things to note with the easy fill dispenser, there is a valve that opens and closes, and there is a pressure gauge that allows you to be able to sense the pressure or to be able to read the pressure um, in the balloon once the balloon has been inflated. So the first step is actually just to get it out. The second step is actually to um, attach the catheter or to attach the extension tubing that has a three-way stopcock on it and to open up the valve. Once that's done, you want to turn on your, um, your, uh, your pressure sensor, which again is on the top of the easy fill dispenser, and you want to make sure that it's zeroed out. Then we take the canister that contains the compressed nitrogen mixed gas and essentially lift the cap of that straight off, because you don't want to have this nozzle. You don't want to bend that at all. So you want to make sure that the cap is coming straight off. Um, next, you're going to slide it directly into the, the um, slot for that, um, that gas canister and close the lever. And what that does is it allows you to have a small amount of gas that pre-fills this catheter. You're use, you will use that pre-filled um, 
uh, gas in order to sense whether or not the balloon has adequately reached the stomach. So you'll then, um, once, the, um, once the gas has equilibrated and your um, pressure reading has settled out, so it's not moving up and down, um, you'll then close the valve and you're now ready to go. You also always, always, always want to make sure that your stopcock is closed off um, to the catheter or to the extension tubing initially. Um, once the patient has swallowed the device, you'll then hook up this tubing. Um, you'll verify that the capsule has reached the stomach first with fluoroscopy. Once you have verified that the capsule has reached fluoroscopy, on, on, uh, has reached the stomach on fluoroscopy, then the second mechanism of making sure that the gas or that the balloon is actually in the stomach is to open up this stopcock. So you're actually allowing that tiny bit of gas that you pre-filled into the extension tubing to go down into the, um, the balloon itself. It's only a small amount of gas, but what happens is once the capsule degrades off of the balloon, the balloon unfolds, that tiny bit of gas goes into the balloon and your pressure drops to less than seven. So that way you know that it's in the stomach and the capsule has come off and you are now okay to open up your valve and fill the balloon. If the device doesn't, if the, if the pressure reading does not come below seven, it means that there's a problem and the balloon itself may actually be stuck in the esophagus. And this has actually ha happened to me once where the balloon um, looked like it was in the stomach, the patient vomited and it came back up right into the GE junction. So it was kind of stuck at the GE junction and my pressure reading did not come down, so I knew that it was not in the stomach. And let's see here. Uh, can you advance for me? It doesn't seem to be advancing for me right now. There we go. So swallowing tips, you want to ensure that the patient is not wearing um, a shirt or bra with metal. They can wear a shirt, they just can't have a bra on underneath with metal in it. Some people advocate changing them to, into a gown. I don't make my patients change into a gown, I just make sure that they don't have any metal on. Um, I also set the mood. You want to make sure that patients are nice and comfortable when they're doing this. It can sometimes be very stressful for them to think about swallowing this large capsule. So I usually have calming music in the background. Our, our, our music of choice for this calming music is usually smooth jazz. Um, and then we always have the team keep a very positive and, and encouraging um, uh, comfort level for the patient. So we are very encouraging um, and try not to stress the patient out. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing is that there's an active, you have to activate this slippery coating that's on the castle, and you do that by submerging it in water for 10 seconds. So I always warn patients that I'm going to be counting to 10 so that they are really ready for it and prepared. I do place the capsule myself into the patient's mouth so I can make sure that the, um, the catheter hasn't become tangled. And then I have them literally chug water or a carbonated be beverage. And when I describe to them how they're going to be drink the, drinking the water, I tell them it's like a college keg party. You are going to chug, chug, chug that water to get that capsule down. Um, if patients try to swallow a little bit and then throw their head back, it really doesn't work. you got to just chug. Um, we also have either banana or applesauce available. Sometimes if the capsule does kind of get stuck at that lower esophageal sphincter, just a little bit of um, something that's semi-solid can help push it down into the stomach. The other thing we're going to talk about is preventing serious adverse events. And this is, some of these next slides are, are really going to be kind of true for both um, the Obalon balloon system and, and other um, fluid-filled balloons as well. So I do always check um, H. pylori status in, in patients pre-placement. The times where I have actually had ulcers in patients, it was in patients who had H. pylori. Um, they also have to all be on a proton pump inhibitor, and that should be started one week before therapy. And if patients develop severe hunger pain, I usually add caraphate. If that's not enough, um, uh, then I, you know, really start thinking that this is more of an ulcer issue. I also stress the importance of avoiding NSAIDs, and I make sure that that's very clear. Um, preventing perforations. Again, patient selection is important. Intragastric balloons are contraindicated in patients with prior foregut surgery if they have an esophageal stricture or if they mention that they have dysphagia and if they have any problems with the capsule swallow or if there's any indication on the barium swallow, I would not um, proceed with um, balloon placement. You want to ensure that the balloons are deflated before removal because that also is more of a risk factor of having um, any kind of esophageal problem. And for the gas-filled balloons, you want to make sure, again, that the balloon has reached the stomach before you initiate inflation. 
The most common symptoms after balloon placement, so the fluid-filled balloons, as many of you are probably placing these balloons at this point, um, just to show some of the differences in management of these patients, is that there's, we have a lot of accommodative symptoms, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, general malaise. Um, you know, I usually tell people to take three to seven days off of work. Sometimes people can go to work earlier than that, but I tell them to take those days off of work just in case. I would probably say that about 80% of my patients need that time off. I give them a lot of medications to prevent these symptoms and also to manage the symptoms. And I would say that for the most part, most of my patients are not vomiting very much, but they still feel pretty junky for those first couple of days. Um, there is also reflux that can occur and gastroparesis. And gastroparesis may, for the fluid filled balloons, be an important part of the weight loss. Um, they also can develop fetid um, urtication, and that's partly because they have lots of food that's sitting in the stomach. They can develop diarrhea and they can develop hunger pain. And there's kind of a difference between the hunger pain that's related to ulcers, which is really more of a pain pain that is sometimes helped with food versus a kind of cramping hunger sensation. For the gas-filled balloons, the accommodative symptoms are much milder. They do have some nausea and cramping, but it really is not a significant problem. And in fact, again, in the, in the trial, that we, the SMART trial, there were no patients that had nausea and vomiting that caused dehydration. Um, whereas we had a, a fair number of patients, um, you know, about 7% of, of patients, um, uh, or not 7% of, well, about roughly 7% of patients. There was a 10% um, incidence of serious adverse events, but most of those, so 75% of those were because of um, uh, dehydration or nausea and vomiting requiring IV um, medication. You can still have reflux with the gas-filled balloons. Gastroparesis is much less, and in fact, there probably isn't a huge change in gastric emptying with the gas-filled balloons. Um, they can still get fetid urtication, but it's not quite as bad. Diarrhea can still occur, and the hunger pains can still occur, and we're going to talk about that more in a minute. So to manage the post-placement accommodative symptoms with the, with the gas-filled balloons, I do start hyothiamine or Lebsin the night before and Zofran the night before as well. Um, having said that, I have a really, and there's a, the, per the protocol from the um, manufacturer, patients are supposed to continue those medications for five days. I have a really hard time getting patients to continue those medications because they typically have more problems with constipation from the lesson than they do from um, any symptoms that they have from the balloon. We don't give IV fluids for these um, procedures. I don't even put an IV in. I have them NPO 12 hours before administration. 24 hours of liquids after they get their um, balloons administered, and then at day two, they advance as tolerated. So pretty different. In terms of reflux, the possible pathophysiology is maybe an increase in diaphragmatic pressure from the intragastric balloons. Again, the delayed gastric emptying may, contrib may be contributing um, to the reflux because there is more food sitting in the stomach for a longer period of time. And it is more common in the fluid-filled balloons than in the um, gas-filled balloons. In terms of the treatment, we increase the, the the proton pump inhibitor is twice a day. We add caraphate. Um, we definitely return these patients to liquid for a few days and see if that helps. And we also add motility agents at times to see if that will help as well. <clears throat> Gastroparesis, again, we think that with the fluid-filled balloons, because we don't think this happens a ton with the gas-filled balloons, but we don't have a lot of data to support that yet, um, that we think that the balloon itself is causing the stomach to um, not contract, as either contract as forcefully or really be able to get food out as quickly. It does correlate with weight loss, but again, might not occur with the gas-filled balloons as much. Um, treatment, if it becomes really severe, is to ensure that the antispasmodic medications have been stopped, um, to return to a full liquid or pureed diet, um, low residue diet as well, and then use the promotility agents again as the same thing that you would do if they were developing um, severe um, uh, reflux, because again, these things kind of go hand in hand. So what about the fetid urtication? So again, this may be because of food material that's in the stomach that's not being able to be digested. Um, treatment for this, again, full liquid diet, try to flush some of these things out, low calorie carbonated be beverages. I also use peppermint oil and peppermint tea. Not only can it help with the smell, but it also is a smooth muscle relaxant and can sometimes help food um, empty out of the stomach. Um, I also have patients sleep on their left, in the left lateral decubitus position, so that you don't have anything that's really obstructing the pylorus and allows food to actually come out. Diarrhea can occur with really any of the balloons. The possible pathophysiology is that it may be related to the proton pump inhibitor, and it could be related to mild bacterial overgrowth, which may be either related to the um, delayed gastric emptying or maybe the 
decrease in gastric acid. So first we may change the proton pump inhibitor itself since we know that proton pump inhibitors can cause diarrhea. Sometimes we just have a short break from the proton pump inhibitor or we use a probiotic and at the last resort using an antibiotic. Um, hunger pains, this is possibly related to the pathophysiology of the migrating motor complex. This does happen more in the gas-filled balloons than the fluid-filled balloons in my experience. Um, this is more of a subtle kind of cramping sensation. And with the migrating motor complex, with the phase three of the migrating motor complex, that actually does trigger a hunger sensation as well. So what we think is happening is with these light balloons that are floating up in the gastric fundus, that the stomach is actually trying to think that these are um, leftover fibrous material that has to be cleaned out, um, debris that needs to be cleaned out before the next meal. And the stomach kind of grabs onto it and tries to shove it out. Um, again, it's associated with a hunger sensation. Um, and what we do for this is I usually first start with a small snack, um, 50 calories or less, because any amount of calories will actually shut off that fasted motor pattern and will start a fed motor pattern. Um, I also use, again, peppermint teas and peppermint oils. And for most patients, that's enough. For patients where that's not sufficient, I'll then add caraphate. Caraphate just kind of gums up the system. It, it really just coats the stomach and makes the stomach just not as able to sense those balloons there. And that's that's our hypothesis. Um, I do have to say, again, that these are a, a lot of these things are just practice experience and hypotheses. I don't have specific data on this, but these are some of the things that um, I've used to help manage patients with these, uh, with the Oblon balloon system and in general with balloons. And that's it. With that, we'll take questions. All right. Thank you all very much. Um, at this time, Dr. Sullivan, Kumbari, and Kumar will address questions received from the audience. Uh, the first question we have is, I've heard that patients sometimes purchase insurance if they are having balloon placement to cover complications like admission for hydration, emergency balloon removal, etc. Do you have any experience with that? And if so, do you know which providers offer this type of insurance? Um, can I uh, um, start with a, a stab at answering this question? So there's one provider that I know of, and they're called Bliss. Um, Bliss actually has a contract with the physician, not with the hospital. A lot of hospitals will not take Bliss because it doesn't actually cover very much. They probably cover about 10% of what the actual bill is um, or less. This is what I've heard from both um, my Barnes Hospital Administration and then from, from UCH. So they don't actually use it. Um, you know, the... There, there may be some other companies that do that, that do it, but this is the one that I actually know of. The other thing that I will say is I, I have on occasion, um, first of all, when I was at Washington University, we actually included it in our, the cost of our balloons was the cost of coverage of complications. And for the most part, the complications that we had were just IV fluids. Um, you are taking a small risk. There is a very small risk that you're going to have a serious adverse event, and the hospital has to be willing to roll the dice on that if they're, if they're willing to do that. Um, at that time, that hospital was. At UCH, they're not willing to do that. They are willing to give IV fluids if needed, but that's it. Everything else is on the patient. I would say that it, I've also talked to um, insurance companies who have said that they aren't necessarily going to refuse to pay for the complications. You can submit that to insurance companies, but you do have to be forthright and not be fraudulent. You have to say what the complication is actually from, and then they would decide whether or not they're going to pay for it or not. Nitin, did you want to add anything to that? I have never been doing a procedure without it because uh, you you really need something in place. The patient, if if they get thousands of dollars in bills, they will recover that one way or another. So I highly recommend using it. All right, then that kind of leads me to the next question here. Um, what is the cost of Aspire and Obalon? Yeah, so I'm going to... I'm going to just say for the actual cost of you um, uh, purchasing the devices, it depends. On, it, it kind of depends. So the sort of maximum price for the Obalons is around $3,000 for the balloon system, and that also includes for the first purchase, I believe, getting the easy fill dispensers because those are reusable. Um, but it all, but it does depend because they do give kind of volume discounts. Essentially, most of the companies give volume discounts. The same thing is true for. Um, Aspire. I believe the Aspire system for a one-year kit, so that includes everything that's needed for the kit, is $4,500. But again, there are volume discounts. So that kind of depends on what your, what your volume 
um, is um, and how many patients you're actually seeing. Okay, uh, the last question that I have here uh, for the evening is uh, regarding the Obolon intolerance. Is it similar to fluid-filled balloons or much less? No. Yeah, it's much less. So the intolerance for the, um, well, like for the Obolon balloon system is much less. And what I was trying to allude to in the slide is if you're used to taking care of patients with the fluid-filled balloon, so my, my, my cocktail of medications that I give for the fluid-filled balloon patients, I usually start with Levson the night before and the morning of. I have them take amend um, at least four to five hours before the procedure. Then I give Decadron and Zofran pre-procedure IV. I give two liters of D5 half normal saline, so I make sure that I kind of top them off and they're fully hydrated. And then I have them continue to take Levson, Zofran, Ativan at night, and then I also give them some tablets of Percocet to take if they have pain. Um, and with that kind of cocktail of medications and kind of working them through with the, you know, oral hydration, I'm able to keep most patients out of the hospital um, from dehydration. Most patients don't have that much vomiting anymore. Um, they still feel kind of junky, but they don't have that vomiting. With the Obolon, and, I, and again, I tell people to take a couple days off of work. With Obolon, I usually do these ad device administrations in the morning before I start my endoscopy day because those patients then go off to work. So I don't put an IV in. Um, I do have them take the Levson and Zofran starting the night before, um, and then they come in, they swallow their capsule, and they leave and go off to work. And like I said, I have, tr I have trouble convincing them to take the Levson and Zofran after they have the capsule administration because most of them just don't have a lot of symptoms. I would like to thank you all for joining us today. We hope this information is useful to you and your practice. And I also want to thank Obalon Therapeutics for their support of this webinar. To view past webinars and to learn about upcoming events, please visit the ABE website at www.bariendo.org. That's B-A-R-I-E-N-D-O.org. This concludes our webinar. Have a good evening.